All right, guys, here we are, episode 84 of the High Performance Podcast. Okay, this is a one collab. Today. It's fucking sweaty as hell, and I apologize for that uh, in the, our studio. But look, this is how much Angus wanted these guests on. So he rings me earlier in the week. He's like, we'll get on Alex Hayes and Will Berkman from Weekly Weights. I'm like, yeah, sick. I'm like, but we've got this new audio set up. We only have three mics. I'm like, I refuse to do it on our old setup because I want to keep treating our guests and listeners to this audio quality. And Angus went out and purchased his first bit of kit for the High Force podcast, is which it? is a fucking first. Did you give me this one? Like no, no, I've got, I've got the fresh. So you've got that fresh boy. Got that fresh mic. Anyway, today we have on Angus, you want to introduce the guest. So we've got Alex Hayes. Hello. We've got Will Berkman. Hello. Um, Most ambitious crossover project since the Avengers. Yes. I reckon, yeah, weekly weights. <laughs> <laughs> or is it, or is it like DC versus Marvel, if that eventually happens? Maybe, maybe. No, maybe. no, that's us versus Mind Muscle Project. They're our nemesis. Anyway, this is yeah. so you guys. Do you guys yeah. know them? No, we don't listen to them. Oh, I've listened to a few. They're actually pretty good. Can't hate it. Was them. Listening- <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I wanted to hate it, but then I listened to it. I was like, fuck, the content is pretty fire. Hey, they put um, in a lot of effort. I want to kick this off by saying, like, something that really annoys me about personal trainers. I know you probably consider yourself more coaches because you work with more of an athletic crowd. But do you have those really annoying PTs always wanting to discuss Ninja Warrior with you guys and talk about it like it's a real sport? Like, I personally feel like it's Australian Idol for personal trainers because they all just think that it's going to be their moment and then someone's going to tap them on the shoulder and be like, hey, man, I think you've got what it takes to be the next Shannon Ponton or Michelle Bridges and be the next big Aussie celeb PT. Uh, do you guys experience that at all? I've honestly had, like, I've had two colleagues or ex-colleagues who have been on Ninja Warrior, so I find that really funny. But, like, I don't think either of them have spent, like, their life gearing up to go on Ninja Warrior. They just happen to be, like, the PT that fit the profile of being, like, sure. kind of, like, lean, can climb on shit and do our handstands and stuff. And, yeah, they've been out there. I reckon it's actually, like, a pretty fun initiative as well, because this is, like, Sarah from Yeah, Willoughby. Sarah was on it. Yeah. yeah um, but, yeah, since, well, we've that, come, since we've come to Lyft, like, we don't, we don't see it. Yeah, Because so, yeah, so, you guys were at Fitness First as well. Yeah. Once yeah. Upon a, which one? Uh, Willoughby. Yeah. And oh, both of Willoughby. Willoughby. Has well, any oh, you were Bondi Platinum as well. Yeah. yeah. When? Um, yeah. I was Bondi Platinum yeah. from 2015 through 2017. I think I was there 2013 to 2015. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's been, everyone's been through the FF system. When are you going to get out, Angus? Um, I reckon I foresee at least another two out. years there. At least another two years. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. But like you see like the ones that have probably hung there a bit too long, I think. Because like, any environment gets stale after a while. Yeah, something I guess you guys, we've had a lot of guys on from Lyft. So Luke Tallick, Jack Darcy trains there. And now you guys, what do you find the benefit is of training at a facility. I know it's catered a lot more to specific sports like powerlifting, weightlifting, and that side of things opposed to a fitness first. Why, what was the transition? I think, well, I think for me, like I'm head of powerlifting, so all that I do now is powerlifting. Well, I have actually, actually have one client who's not a powerlifter, but everyone else is a powerlifter. Um, so for me, it's like the equipment, we run competitions, like it's a community. It's more of like about the community and the gym rather than just like working for yourself. So do you not accept athletes who won't compete or... No, no, no. I have a lot, I have a lot who don't compete. But, but it's all... It's, that, it's all geared towards like a testing day. And then once they do one of them, then they usually want to compete because everyone around them is competing. So. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as for me, like similar, um, I went traveling. So I stopped personal training and did online only while I was doing my placement for dietetics. And then I wrapped up all of that, handed off like all of my clients to Alex actually. And then went overseas for a few months. And when I was there, I sort of had like had the feeling that I wanted to go back to PT, but I felt that the fitness first environment for me was just a bit too much and a bit too commercial. So then Lyft is somewhere that I've been training at for a long time. I'm like part of the furniture and like we were saying, great community, great spot to train. And so I was much more attracted to actually spending my days there. Whereas fitness first, it was like, I was good to be there for three hours at a time. And then I really needed to like go outside and have a break. You they know? are very like, especially Angus's gym. It's in a basement of a building. Like, I wouldn't want to. That's do my more main beef back with the FF there. setup. Like it's it's a great little setup there, but some natural <laughs> light would just change the game there. But yeah. it'd be hard to drill a sunlight down. Sorry, a skylight down that far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent great. Like great places to run a business. And now like the fitness first are getting better and better equipped. So there's nothing wrong with them as gyms, but just as an environment to work in. Like if you're in, I don't know if you're concerned by your own sanity. Then, then you can't be there all the time. Yeah, even like Angus comes, like to me, obviously we talk about a lot of shit and Angus always come in hot watch and whinging yourself, about- Watch yourself here. You look, whinging about someone, management, this and that, and I'm like, fuck. No, it's never imagine been, we just shoot the shit, it's just a bag of old fired, Don't get him fired. Yeah, sorry yeah. Angus. Well, he works himself, so technically he shouldn't be able to get fired, but they'll get rid of you. What? <laughs> <laughs> what do you 
didn't mean. Don't worry. I didn't mention names. Mm. Don't name name. Fuck. I just completely derailed my train of thought. Anyway, so what? 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 what, what say? I didn't mention any names. Rattled. Yeah, Angus, you really rattled. Bro. I've never been this rattled on the podcast. Our, no, no. our podcast you. gets like this too. Yeah, we usually just cut it out though. Yeah, I'm not. I'm gonna, we can't cut anything this out. Oscar's eh? such a shit editor. I just so can't be online coaching is something that every PT claims to do. Few actually do it. Yeah, it's always in your Instagram bio. Yeah, and Will, you've had like how long have you been a coach for? Uh, I mean, I was coaching people before I was PT, so 2014 through now, so four years. Four but, years. Like I would consider it something I was actually doing as a profession, quote unquote, for three with a break in the middle. Yeah, but you've had some pretty high profile clients. How did you tee that up? I know Sheedle um, hopped on board and Yeah, so even a bit of coaching of Ray Williams <laughs> out of the back of a competition. Yeah, Ray Williams. So I can't really lay much claim to Ray Williams as success. Um, I did have breakfast with him on competition day and uh, what what was the size of the breakfast? Oh, like? it's unbelievable. So <laughs> did, you, did you mention coming on the High Performance Podcast? What year was it? That was twenty fifteen. Oh, I, you could tell he was thinking about it. He was thinking about it before <laughs> you had him he was like, Who are my top favourite athletes yeah, of yeah. all time? Um, <laughs> Who did no. you say? I can't remember. Uh, I I th- it was, there was definitely Deion Sanders. There were some running backs in the NFL. Oh, yeah, have to be NFL. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's isn't he? Yeah, yeah he yeah. loved the roll tide. No, maybe he didn't mention any athletes because I fucking love the roll tide, like Crimson Tide. Sorry, but yeah, I got it. Like Ray Williams' breakfast. This actually brings me one, like brings to mind one of my favorite anecdotes about him. So he weighed around 180 kilos at Worlds this year. Is that right? 187, I think. 186. Yeah. So he weighed in at about 163 or 164 in Uzbekistan, where he squatted a world record. And the brekkie buffet ran from about seven in the morning till about 11. So I would usually go down for breakfast at seven because I'm an early riser, and then I'd go back at like 10:30 and have a snack. And Ray Williams would be there the whole time, right? <laughs> just and eating all Just away. eating and like just and, grazing like a cow. Yeah, and he's the, like he's a lovely guy, like quite polite and quiet. Um, and and eventually I was talking to him and I was like, oh, you know, Ray, like, how are you finding the food? And he goes, man, I've lost so much weight while I've been here. He's been there for like a week. And he was saying he'd lost like 10 or 13 kilos because he didn't like the food. But the guy was literally parked at the buffet for like four just hours at a time. Yeah, and I was like, what do you miss? And he was like, oh, I just want to have like chicken and waffles. <laughs> <laughs> he loves grits. Chicken and rice. That's what chicken he said Chicken and rice. Chicken and rice. Hilarious. Like, Did they have rice in Uzbekistan? They had like everything. They did, but Man, not, not at that place. Not the seasoning. Yeah. The, they wanted that southern. The food was pretty spice. fucking weird there, for real. I thought it was, you guys it was, was good. The it was good once we got out of the hotel. Yeah. The food in the hotel was fucking weird. Yeah. What's Uzbekistan like as a country? Like, um, I, I don't can, know. How many Uzbeki listeners do you have? The, the people look. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you. My coach is Uzbeki. I think he might tune in. The, the people it. look like a mix between Chinese and Russian. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, so like uh, very Slavic, the Kazakhstan way. Which for weightlifting does yeah, not kind of get like, better. Kind that of Asian like, European hybrid is insane. Kind of like that, but like not as dark, like mm. more like pale. Yeah, more like light skin than yeah. than Kazakhs. See. Um, so what's it like as a place? It's weird because now you're safe. We don't have any. We have Israeli, oh, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, um, dude, how's it, the, our main African listeners are from Uganda? Uganda. Yeah, but we're Middle East. It's only Qatar, so Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Uganda, be kidding. So me. you're safe. Um, you can go on about Uzbekistan. <laughs> Uzbekistan, no. Nah. Also, okay. I like that dad joke. You're yeah. Oh, mate, that's first of many coming up. Don't worry. <laughs> um, Uzbekistan. So it's a weird, like, really weird place because it's kind of a shithole at first glance. Like, you get into Tashkent. And you're going through and there's buildings that are like obviously Soviet era buildings and stuff that are, you know, 25 stories high where the top 15 stories are like crated out, no windows, like looks like shit. And then there's like big marketplaces that are lovely and vibrant, but still kind of a bit gray. And then they've got like this beautiful Royal Palace, which we didn't visit. And if you go outside the city, there's like beautiful mountains and stuff around it. So it's sort of like, it's got aspects of like natural beauty and historical beauty. And then in the middle, it's just like squalor. And I think they had like a really hectic dictator who only died or something last year as well. So I'd say they've been really mismanaged. And it's one of those places that's just been like economically sort of run into the ground because of the whole Soviet era or whatever beforehand. But you um, felt safe? Yeah, 100% oh, felt safe. Mm. I mean, we it's didn't really go out at we, night. We had to like always have our passport on us because there would be guards just like walking around the streets. The money. And if you didn't have your passport on you, yeah, the money's funny. But if you didn't have your passport on you, they could like fine you or something. Yeah. So Why? If, they think, if you're foreign. Well, like, they think you might be a spy or something like that. It's just corruption. Yeah. It's like they won't, you can't sell back Uzbeki money and exchange it for something else on the way out because their money's worth nothing. So here's, <laughs> here's a really good example, right? We got there and one Aussie dollar at the airport, you could get like two and a half thousand Uzbeki, whatever they're called, 
um, on the way in, right? They and everybody was Becky, weren't they? Uzbek or something? Something, but it doesn't no, matter. Anyway, okay. we're, so we're on the way in. <laughs> Somebody can fact check that very easily. We're on hey, the way hey, in. Hey, that's what no, no fact check. check. No fact okay. check. Okay, okay good. Do that for Don't us. fact so check this know. story. Don't fact check this story. Expect but it's true. DM on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we've gone in. People are like don't exchange your money at the airport. Do it at the hotel. The bellboy, his name was it was like Shamsadi, but we call him Sammy. Um, Sammy will sort you out. So we don't exchange anything there. Right? And I'm like, I'm giving myself 800 bucks to spend in a week. Like, that should be plenty. Is yeah. it like on Eurotrip you where they get one the US dollar? They get one US dollar in, uh, I forget where they are on Eurotrip. Man, dude, this will blow your mind. So we get there and it was like well after midnight when we arrived because going through the airport, there's a clusterfuck because there's like no importation tax on things you buy from outside the country. So people would buy literally like, uh, sorry, if you're a member of Uzbeki Airways or something. So people would buy like all of their white goods. I'm talking like they'd buy a fridge, washing <laughs> machine and a television. And you could have like unlimited luggage on the plane. So people were literally oh, bringing in like pretty dirty. much shipping crates worth of shit and they check everything at customs. So we were behind everybody because everybody's literally bringing in like 15 boxes, right? So it takes us three hours to get through customs. It's retarded. But we were behind everyone because we didn't, there was no one at the um, oh, place exactly to check English. our visas. Oh, that's And we had to wait at that booth for like. And, and you guys are with the Australians. No, there, there, was only, no. there was only five of us. Yeah, we were running. It was, it was four, four of us, Jules. Um, Doug, Doug, me and Will, and then this older guy, Eric, comes with yeah, us. Legend. Um, anyway, we get to the hotel, <laughs> and and we go to Sammy, and we go, oh, mate, we need to change some money. It's like 12.30, 1 a.m. He's like, yeah, sweet, I'll meet you in your room. How much do you want to change? I'm like, oh, 800 bucks. So, you know, like 800 times 2,000. So the guy goes and gets a wheelbarrow, I'm guessing. Oh, mate, so much better. We're sitting in my hotel room, and he comes in, the guy's got a sack over his shoulder. <laughs> right? And he goes, he goes, oh, $800 is like three and a half million was Becky. And so I'm like, okay, well, like if it's three and a half million, you're going to get like 50,000 notes. No, it was Becky's come or whatever come in like- 1,000 up to 1,000, was it? I think it's 10,000. It might've been like 500. So the guy's giving us stuff. We literally couldn't fit all our money in our safe. And so when we would go out, if you go out and buy like down the road, you get, he was giving us like 4,000 per dollar, right? So you go down the road and you'd buy lunch, which would be like um, a kebab and a Coke or something. And it'd cost 12,000. So it was literally $3. And they had a money counting machine that they had to put the stuff in because he'd give them like 15 notes and he'd go <laughs> and tell them there was no money. I wonder their economy is so, fucked. Yeah, so you're in a code, <laughs> right? At least if everyone feels like a rapper. Yeah, yeah you yeah, got to do the money oh, yeah, all the time. funny story about rappers. Yeah, this. so you got money like in a wad like fucking the size of your fist in your pocket and you'd have to like rub a bandit and that's just to buy <laughs> what, about, what about when we were at the banquet? Yeah. We were fucking making it rain on Robert right. Wilkes on the yeah. dance floor. And he's got his shirt half unbuttoned, stuffing money down the front of it. It was made. If someone had that footage to sell to the IPF right now. Oh, the best thing, right? <laughs> so all the Uzbeki men, they had like these chicks who were sort of doing belly dancing and stuff. They would like punctuate their show. They had this amazing entertainment. It was the best. And they're punctuating the show with these Uzbeki chicks doing dancing. They got like progressively skimpier and they're eventually like in underwear sort of doing belly dancing. And at the end, they're standing there and all these Uzbeki men are throwing like 100 or 500 Uzbeki notes at them while they're dancing. And I was doing the maths while I'm there and I'm like, that's literally the equivalent of you showering a stripper with five cent coins, right? <laughs> okay, it was dope. so good. There was money everywhere. It was the best. It would be a good feeling, but and then you go outside and there's just reality and you're like, oh fuck, it's a shithole. Our economy's actually fucked, but you're at the strippers just making it rain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's hectic. Yeah, that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah so that's that's been... Oscar. Oh yeah, so yesterday I was got in the depths of YouTube, and um, have you guys heard of Jumper? He's the movie. He hosts, no, he hosts a podcast, so he's heavily in the rap game. Anyway, I stumbled across his vlogs, and it was like, um, fucking, who's the guy in Gucci Gang? Ah, uh, you know, surely. Um, Lil, Lil Pump. Pump. So Lil, Lil Pump. Pump, this guy Jumper, no Jumper, he's called, and there's like, so he's in his forties, and he's driving around this mini bus full of like. Those sort of mumble rappers, face tats, XXX Tension, that sort of character. That guy died last year. Yeah, time. he died. Oh, his album's fucking fire. It's it's good. Good. He's so a good guy. So. I don't no, know, he, like he's a horrible person. Yeah. Like, and you can tell. So it's good that he's dead, but he also made a good album. Yeah, so it's yeah, yeah. kind of perfect anyway. scenario. Released a good album, but bad person. Died straight after, so yeah. he doesn't get to enjoy the success. But That's anyway, as clean as it gets. I'm, so out of my I'm watching this thing, nice. and like, they're staying in the shittiest motels. I'm like, fuck, maybe they don't make that much money. But then they're like, literally counting their hundreds in the back of their shitty minivan on tour and just like in out of Gucci, Balenciaga, just like flexing and then staying in the worst hotels. It made me think, I'm like, these guys are making so much money and then when they're done, I'm like, they put it over a house. It's, and that's why I could never be a rapper. Position. I think too much about my future. That's the, that's the, my that's the main story. reason. But they're, 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 money, they're money, like they're in the back of the coast stacks and like they're, you can't even understand these guys talk. 
and then all we can see here is like Gucci, Balenciaga, and they roll in, buy like all these sneakers, tens of thousands of dollars worth of clothes, back to their shitty motel, just all about the gram, all about just, just flexing on them hoes. It's like the that. standard, like, you win the lottery and then you go broke a year later story. Yeah, though. exactly. Yeah, Have you seen uh, 30 for 30, ESPN yeah, Broke? Yeah, yeah, no, That is yeah, the so fucking good. best. So, so I, I forget who was in the 90s, an African-American player. Uh, he won the Super Bowl and you get, like, at the time, it was like $500,000 bonus. And it's the next day and he's yeah. been out. And they're like, oh, what are you going to spend the money on? And he's like, what money? And he's like, they're like, half a million dollars that you got yesterday. You go, spend it. <laughs> and he has this watch it's like encrusted with diamonds and they can't resell all this crazy there's, jewelry they get there's a story of um, in that mo- in that doco about Jamal Mashburn the NBA guy who signs the feeler contract the shoe contract yeah and he gets given at 19 years old a Ferrari stick that he can't even drive because he doesn't know how to drive a manual oh, as that a is signing awesome. bonus on his, on his shoe contract that's correct. guys wait till we get money for this podcast and we're going to spend it especially Angus in the most outlandish way oh absolutely like, well, we're the first thing we're going to spend fun. it on is sponsor, yeah, sponsoring all those jerseys yeah, yeah, we're going to sponsor each jersey, but then I'm going to buy like grills, like heaps of custom jewelry, like just fucking just ridiculous. Mask, just our mic. Massive collection of Jordans. Get grilled, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. get it into your fucking skull. Yeah, I'll get Jordan. <laughs> no, I'm saying for the mics, like iced out mics and shit. <laughs> <laughs> and we just like first fitness podcast with iced out mics. Yeah, that's like the other way you said we yeah, weren't a fitness the podcast. <laughs> yeah, kill the audio. You can just see ting 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 diamonds <laughs> dropping off. <laughs> um, steering this back to something powerlifting related. So with that Uzbekistan trip, what was the competition? Uh, that was, it was the Asia and Oceania championships. And usually, I think people no, think yeah. when you're representing your country, that uh, a sporting organisation would like to help you get to the event. But as I understand it, all that stuff's self-funded in powerlifting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the Australian government just in general is really bad. Because it's a government the gov- run organisation, yeah? No. Is it affiliated with the government? Uh, it is affiliated with the government, but the sport itself doesn't get any funding from the government until it reaches a certain tier. I think you need an so, Olympic standard or no, a unified no, world if, championships. If you're, if you're at a world championships and you're successful at a world championships, then you will get ah, funding. So okay. we never had a world champion. Interesting. We had a second place last year, at least one second. Yeah. In the Opens, that is. Yeah. And is that in the... Because obviously there's the different sort of like belts in fighting. There's the different categories or is that on a world stage not true? There's Powerlifting is such a shit show when you're trying to compare, like more so than any other sport, when you're trying to compare lifters across divisions because not only do you have the whole tested versus untested, you've got single ply, multiply, people who squat in sleeves, people who do it in wraps, people yeah. who are walking out of their squats, people who aren't, people who are pulling on a stiff bar, Versus a desert so can, bar. Can you obviously different. your guy? Can you just give us a good yeah, idea of the landscape of where you sit in that? And so where, where we sit in it? And, and no, your your category because obviously I would assume yours is the one most likely uh, to be government funded one day, or is that sort oh, of it's it's in some like in some it's kind of up in the air at the moment because yeah. of the whole like. Uh, being removed from the IPF thing. Can you just give us a, a, as quick as you can a synopsis of that just to fill in our listeners about what's happening with the IPF at the moment? Uh, okay. Look, you can as know, diplomatically you, or yeah. undiplomatically as oh, you would like. Okay. I'll state oh. it as factual as I can and Alex can correct the record as I go. So, Robert Wilkes, who is the head of Powerlifting Australia and the Oceania Powerlifting Federation, has been involved in the International Powerlifting Federation. That's the overarching government body for however long, like 15, yeah, 20 30 years, years? 30 years? Yeah, long long. Forever. Um, and he was the head or, or he was the chairman of their anti-doping um, panel for quite a while as well. Um, I think what happened initially was he tendered his resignation because he felt like the IPF wasn't actually taking anti-doping seriously and then rescinded his resignation, but they didn't accept the rescinding of his resignation. Rescinsion? Yeah, didn't fuck. That's a yeah, hard word. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I only yeah. just worked out the definition based on the context you yeah. used it in, so I so can correct He that. took it back. Um, <laughs> to all the lifters who were just <laughs> for took the, it back for the layman. Don't you get eloquent at me? Yeah, <laughs> and they um they didn't accept that. So then he cracks the shits, and that was the start of um or I mean, in some ways the start of a legal dispute that's gone for quite a while. Um, he then started leveling accusations against the IPF of corruption of members of their executive not following their constitution of the IPF not actually meeting the requirements for being a registered entity in um, Luxembourg where it is registered and all these other things. Um, and then he he sort of asserts that the IPF were taking retaliatory action against him by doing things that penalized Australia and the Oceania nations and tried to basically stop them from being able to exercise their voting rights in Congress because 
he, again, this is all allegation, he sort of alleges that the head of the IPF was basically trying to disenfranchise them because if they used their voting rights, then they could stop him doing all this stuff that So is was, the head of the IPF a character like the head of FIFA and that would like... Well, like... And Bernie Eccleston, the guy out of F1, like a real... Like, were you, <laughs> were you to hear Robert Wilkes say it? Yes, but again, all this stuff is, like, is due to be put before a court. So, and like, I don't know the guy, I don't, like... I've only heard Rob Williams. Oh, Williams. <laughs> Robbie Williams. <laughs> Robbie, <laughs> Robbie Williams is version of a man. Robbie yeah. Williams. As All detailed right. in, yeah. Right. <laughs> no, as detailed in, let me entertain you. Um, so, so yeah, anyway, all that happens. Um, and it culminates in last year, the IPF at their general assembly for the year, um, putting forward a vote to expel Robert Wilkes from the IPF and all bodies affiliated with him. Um, so that's Oceania, which is the, um, chairman of or president of and Australia which he's the owner and CEO of right um, and then that kicked off a political shitstorm in Australia so Robert Wilkes has taken them to court for that saying it's unconstitutional for a thousand reasons where do you go to court but um, so he's taken one case to the court for arbitration of sport but they weren't they said they lacked jurisdiction because they need to go to I think the Supreme Court in Luxembourg first to get a ruling before they can sort that case so there's multiple legal cases that and have to be He's resolved. obviously just and extremely there's... passionate about this because I take it he's not going after it for money because I don't think there's a whole heap of money. No, in he's, not, he's actually lost a lot of money he's fighting. Just, and fighting he wants all the money back or he won't get money. Oh, wow. No, he's not, he's not in it for the money. He just wants to see the sport be like actually fair Fuck, and everyone good. on a level yeah. playing field. If you, yeah. listen, if you listen to our podcast with him, yeah, it's good. Yeah, well, episode, actually, okay. there you episode go, guys. Seven, episode seven Wilkes. of Weekly Weights. There you go. If you want to go hear about Robert Wilkes and Because for me, I considered myself as someone who, without actually participating in powerlifting, like I watch as much powerlifting as I can and I was still not privy to a lot of the information well, in that. Because it? from my perspective, well, just... It's, there's more to it. Oh, sorry, you go on. No, yeah. because that's because I'm always like scouring the internet for more information on this whole conflict. And it, it just like, are there other nations outside of Oceania who are kind of like leaning more towards Wilkes, but maybe not speaking out for fear of the similar sort of treatment? Or again, to, what's the to vibe? hear Robert say it? Yes, and he's he said that even prior to him being expelled from. Um, from the IPF that there were people sort of speaking to him saying we got to set up a rival organisation because of all this stuff. And they're sort of trying to paint him as just the crazy raving lunatic, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, and there are like there are people out there who absolutely believe Robert Wilkes is a crazy raving lunatic and would say he's corrupt and he does unconstitutional things and he's just a guy who's trying to throw his power around and you know he's just a despot himself. But you know, as somebody who like knows him and works with him, I genuinely believe he has the best intentions for the sport. And so, you know, I'm like, I'm inclined to believe him, but again, all of this stuff is stuff that has to basically be played out before the courts. Um, it sounds like absolute... But yeah, there's stuff. more to most, it again. Most of it started from um, the drug testing in the IPF or lack thereof drug yeah. testing in the IPF, essentially. Like, yeah. Robert had a problem with there not being enough drugs, drug tests. <laughs> not enough drug tests. <laughs> Robert had not enough drug tests, <laughs> tests conducted. And um, yeah, it's kind of just stemmed from there. Yeah, it sucks, but because Australia had a, like a really thriving and as far as I can tell growing powerlifting scene mm, especially the tested go. side of it and now it's kind of just been carved down the middle right and people are kind of forced into a situation where they're going to have to choose to stay in the Australian IPF affiliate or go what's the new org organisation? The, the APU but it also so Robert Wilkes is also starting an international body yeah, for world that world powerlifting no, so, so why don't we get that part so, of the story out for context as well yeah okay you so go. when powerlifting Australia was removed from the IPF alongside of um, Robert himself and the whole of the Oceania region. Um, Australia started a new affiliate under the IPF called APU, whereby lifters could then attend world championships. Okay. Which is fine, makes sense. Yeah. Um, Powerlifting Australia still stays the same, minus its IPF affiliate. And then from that, Robert has started with the Oceania uh, federations that were also kicked out, plus um, another federation which is mostly America Cause it's called 100% Raw okay. and formed what's called World Powerlifting. 100% Raw. That's, yeah, fuck. Yeah, sounds, yeah, like, sounds like some rappers love life. It's pretty, yeah, it's very <laughs> nice. Oh, like, that was pretty well, anyway, what, I said <laughs> anyway, <laughs> 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 yeah, they deal with that shit all the time. It's like when I'm coaching weightlifting, I have a new club, they're like, <laughs> snitch, jerk. Yeah. And I just like, I can't stand the emotional energy I was like, anymore. I was like, 18 or 19 I did weightlifting for a little bit my coach always used to be like oh nothing feels as good as a good snatch and I was like yeah yeah real good yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> I was 
was like, oh, I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but then I like let out a little fart and giggle for an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you got it. You're but yeah, anyway, so now there's two global federations. Well, there's more than two, but two big ones: the IPF and World Powerlifting. So who yeah. are kind of in opposition to each other? Yeah, of time. I've heard whispers that New Zealand's can do that well, as well. No, they're not getting booted out. They've actually. Hang on, I'll find you the thing. But I feel like the IPF actually, actually one of those no, things. Like, like, you can't leave. It. You're fired. They have a vote on it. Ooh. It's crazy um, that there's. I suppose it's coming like, next week. Um, but it's crazy yeah. that there's not much money in either side because usually like we look at boxing, mixed martial arts, all that sort of thing, and there's money that comes into play to stopping people like Unify Belts and have a, a I guess a global world championship. Dude, standard. I wish they had belts instead of medals. In I think it'd be sweet. But um, I think in it's just weird. every now and then they give out like swords and stuff. Yeah, it's sick. Got yeah, it. big dogs yeah. in the Pro Bowl, yeah. Um, Untested does have some cool aspects to it. Like, are you sick of walking out squads? No, no I, don't I, care. I actually like walking out squads. Yeah. Okay, so now for me, and also I should apparently have about this. Apparently, too. unracking a bar on a mono lift is really hard. Never I, I would find it awkward to like get my feet in the position and then just go up. But and I can't imagine squatting anything I couldn't walk out. Yeah, but it's like in- yeah, like I can walk out anything, but. I'll miss the squat. So yeah. like, the walkout is the limiting factor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. Because Angus, this is saying I want to talk to you about true. exactly what Alex that's just true, mentioned. Yeah. Then, but yeah. with with the mono lift, the most of the guys who lift and girls who lift uh, using a mono rack wear knee wraps, yeah. which makes it literally harder for them to walk. Like, have you ever had your knees wrapped? Yes. Yeah. By <laughs> Alex Lowe. Like, yeah. <laughs> and could you walk? Uh, no. Yeah. So <laughs> imagine hard, doing that. Like some of these people squat four hundred plus kilos. Like. When your knees are wrapped like that, having to actually walk a bar out would You're be not moving. insane. Yeah, like I couldn't squat 60 to depth. I couldn't squat 100 to depth and I had my knees wrapped like that. I couldn't even approach the bar probably. It hurt so badly. Yeah, well, you need a certain so, amount of weight to push you down into yeah. the correct position. So like the the guys who are lifting single ply in the IPF who have their knees wrapped and have to unwrap and walk out a bar, like and I reckon- squat suit. Hmm? And yeah. in a squat suit. And in a squat suit. Like that would be unbelievably difficult just assuming the position for them. Like, yeah. yeah. So your competition is knee sleeves, sleeves no wrap. It's called raw. Yeah, so knee sleeves, belt. Yeah, what's well, called cool, classic in the RPF. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah, should yeah, we just do a terminology belt. rundown? Yes, yeah, 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 definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah. All right. Um, so two, I reckon we start at the top and go like raw and equipped. So two like branches of powerlifting. There is powerlifting, which has like minimal supportive equipment, which you would call raw, or in the IPF, they call it classic, but people call it raw powerlifting. And then on the other side, there's powerlifting where they use supportive equipment. So squat suits, bench press shirts, and people wear a deadlift suit or a squat suit for the deadlift, um, where they do use supportive equipment that changes the technique of the lift a little bit and it helps you lift more. So we can So that's like a neoprene, like drop crutch pant for a squat suit or something like that. Like, how do they work? Man, you're talking to a dude who doesn't know the first like thing about fashion. Super duper drop tight. crutch. <laughs> Did you ever watch Geordie Shaw in season one or two? Yeah, five. Yeah, 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 all up in that drop crutch shit. It's a great it's, show. A, it's like a lower crutch in a jean or a short. I uh, know, they're pretty high like crutch. The squat, like, uh, the squat suits are like super tight through the hips. Mm. So it gives you a lot of support through the hips. And with the knee wraps, you get a lot of bounce out of the bottom. Yeah. In an equipped squat. So like, that's part of the reason why equipped squat technique is often a little bit different because to get the most out of your suit, you should be actually trying to stretch the material of the suit. So push your hips back. Whereas a raw squat, because you're using more of your quadricep, at least you should be using more of your quad, you should have a slightly more upright squat, you know, where your knee actually travels forward a bit more. Although I guess you do get more out of the rack by having your knee travel and stay forward too. Anyway, so we compete under the raw side. So that's the one with less supportive equipment. Um, and then and also less gear, theoretically, because testing's heavier, or is that... Well, I mean, there is untested federations that still have raw powerlifting. Okay. Um, but yeah, then there's then there's disputes underneath raw or classic powerlifting as to how much supportive <coughs> equipment you can use. So we compete with knee sleeves, which give you a small amount, um, like a small amount in your squat. We use belts and wrist wraps, but for us, that's it for supportive equipment. But there are some people who would compete with the same restrictions, except instead of knee sleeves, they use wraps which do add a significant amount to your squat as well. So there's raw and then there's raw with wraps, but essentially it's the same thing. No supportive suit that you wear, mm. but a little bit of supportive stuff elsewhere. But like we were saying earlier, the another difference would be the walking out of the squat. Mm. So in raw with wraps, a lot of the federations, they use a monolith rather than just walking out of a rack. So a monolith for people who don't know, is basically a big squat rack with like levers on it and you stand the bar up and then your spotters pull a lever and the actual rack itself swings away. So you don't have to step anywhere. Whereas what we compete out of is basically like just, you know, two uprights with a base and you stand the bar up and then walk it out from that. So it's like a normal squat rack. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then under the equipped side, there's differences in how much actual support you can get out of your suits. So in the international, um, 
they have single ply equipment, so as in that's one layer of the supportive material. Though again, I think within that there's a bit of sort of back and forth over like what they can actually do legally, like how much thickness and support they can get. But there's one layer and then multiply is like you can have, you know, two or three layers of ply. Um, and again, the more supportive equipment you have, I guess more the tech, like the more the technical aspects of the lift change, but also the more support you get. So people who are benching like, you know, 1100 pounds or whatever that you might see on like US side videos and stuff are usually benching in a triple ply bench suit. Because I think that's shirt. something that's lost on a lot of people because Louis Simmons, as far as he's marketed to the general pop is as the greatest powerlifting coach with the strongest powerlifters. But I think that that's something that's always sort of avoided the topic of the supportive equipment. Not that it's obviously there's still beasts and things like that, but especially with the bench press, because that's the one where you get the most out of the suit. Yeah. Correct? All of a sudden they're benching more than they fucking I think the um. I think the worst thing about the, those Westside guys is the actual, like, the judging of the squat. Yeah. Did, oh. like, did you see Dave's Hoff, the, Dave Hoff's recent? Yeah, outrageous. Stint? Like, oh, yeah. what did he squat, like, 1,200 or something? <laughs> something. Yeah, yeah he squatted 1,200 to about, like, what, 40% depth. 1,200 pounds, so what are we talking in kilos there? 500. Someone quick maths. 550? 570? 2.2. 2.2, yeah. Yeah, so about 570. You do the maths yeah, yourself. You've all got iPhones. Something. Yeah. But then that guy, he just anyway, stood like, up, the but, monorac but, went but, out, he sunk down, stood back up. Well, then Louis, that. Sick. But then Louis okay. can say, Louis can say right. like, I've got all these guys who squat over a thousand well, pounds, but they don't it? really fucking squat. Yeah. yeah, it's not a squat. It's yeah. more like just half squat. You, he claims the and, most and, thousand. And those pounds guys are getting featured on Quarter Squat Gang. Yeah. Do you guys see that Instagram? Yeah, Quarter Squat Gang's yeah, fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, he's <laughs> crazy. Guy's pretty strong himself. Yeah. What I'm, federation does he? I actually don't know who runs it. Uh, he posted about himself on the story only. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's pretty strong. Um, Asian guy. Yeah, I mean, they're like, I, there's obviously some like some validity to the West Side training methods for equipped powerlifting um, because they do have that, like they do have that history of success, whether it's actually the best way or it's just the way in which the people with the access to the best environment and drugs and coaching have gone. There's also that Burley Hawk guy, which is oh, the man, best fucking name of so all good. time. And he claims that it works for Raw, but then yeah. is he any good? Oh, and he's reasonable to me. Burley, like he's a pretty good lifter, but like, in spite of his training, maybe. Well, I mean, yeah. who's I mean, to say in spite of his training? Like, yeah, yeah. who knows? But um, but yeah, there are people who say that the reason the West Side, you know, the West Side, like records have gotten so much better over time is basically because the equipment that they use is better and the judging's gotten more lax. I don't know if that There's really more starch in the washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't know if that really actually captures it. Like, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is some degree to which their training methods are okay but they do seem to fly in the face of 90% of the things that we would say are like principles of training, at least governing raw training, which is even, what Alex and I do. Even outside of uh, the training principles, something from my perspective as well is just the long-standing impact of like the technical aspect of it. Like he commonly says the triceps are the primary mover in the bench press. Well, they it are doesn't in, say that it's in equipped. They so are you've in got equipped, all these yeah. people in commercial gyms and this was even an influence on me back in the day before I realized there was a difference between raw and equipped lifting where yeah. like, you've got all these people with their elbows so far underneath their wrist. Sorry, not underneath, like mm, front past of the, their front wrist. Of the bar, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. What are some of the things yeah, like, I see that technique-wise that people need to forget about when they're, that they might be hearing from someone like Louis? Okay, well, like, like, yeah, like lifting. we said earlier with the squat, they're gonna sit back more into the suit. Those vertical shins. Yeah, so the vertical, they shins, the vertical don't shins. Yuck. So we suit actually, vertical shins. Because you want to sit back and get You want to sit back and get a lot out of the, the suit, which is really tight to the hips. So you want to get okay. that spring to the hips, right? Where did the no knees over toe come from? There was one study like in the 70s actually. Think, like uh, increased force through the knee, but it's like you're meant to put force through your fucking knee. Okay, so it wasn't up. from someone squatting in a squat suit. That might have probably influenced it as well because all the heavier squatters in the world were squatting with vertical shins. But yeah, if you look if you look at the difference between like if you just pause the lifter in an equipped squat at the bottom, or the bottom, which isn't really mm. the bottom. Contentious versus, topic. <laughs> versus like pausing where Ray Williams is at the bottom, or Blaine Sumner was another good someone who squats better raw. His like, walk out knee, is phenomenal. The knees are gonna be a lot further forward, the torso is gonna be a lot more upright. For the raw so squat. For the raw yeah. squat versus for the equipped squat because in the raw squat, we want to use our quads in the bottom, yeah. where they're in the most flexed position. And in the equipped squat, we want to sit back into the suit. So that's so another that's reason why Louis like emphasizes lower back training for squats 
enormously because, like, again, they're going to be folded over and sat way back through the hips. And How much that's why they do squat. That's why they do a lot of box squats. They, they don't test. I, is, I, is, is it forbidden? Box forbidden? Like, no, I, my guys are ready to compete at two weeks' notice any time of the year because yeah. they squat to a fucking box. <laughs> yeah, look. <laughs> um, I can't remember the last time. I, oh, no, I did box squats in, like, 2013 with my first cycle with a mirror, and I reckon I was box squatting, like, 160 for three, and at the time I could, like, proper squat... 160. It's a good learning tool like for I, general I, I use them yeah, for sure. I, I use them when my knees get a bit sore. But you're not to really... Limit, just to limit my depth because my knee hurts more when I go lower. Yeah, when it's I, bad. I don't but think yeah, they're much use for building the raw squat once you've learned how to do it, but I do use box squats for heaps of clients that I'm teaching to squat because heaps of people are too inclined to try and stay too upright when they squat. And so when you like when you try and keep your chest up and your knees shoved forward, what happens late in the squat is in order to rebalance and actually keep the weight over the middle of your foot, your hips have to fall back, which means the chest falls forward. And then oftentimes that leads to them falling onto their toes. So when you give them a target behind them to sit back to, and you can still say like, let your knees break, but go hips back to the box. They tend to actually balance and move in that more balanced way between the knee and hip. So they learn like a proper squat pattern. But once they can do that properly, I start to get rid of the box. And then once they're actually doing that squat pattern fine, just with control, then I start to introduce things like actual tempo and accelerating into the hole and getting a bit of a stretch reflex and stuff. But beyond like, Beyond that beginner phase, I reckon box squats for all lifting are, for the most part, shit. But what no about point. bands and accommodative resistance? How do you feel about well, that for raw lifting? In the squat, um, the hardest part of the equip squat is going to be like the top half because obviously you've finished getting the rebound from the suit. So for them training, the, like for it to be heavier at the top is probably an advantage. Do they train their box squat equipped or raw? Uh, I think uh, some of them, I think, yeah, both. Yeah, and both. oftentimes they'll wear like just briefs or whatever. So supportive pants, but not full yeah, suit. Yeah, they won't put the straps up. Or yeah, like straps down, okay. suit and stuff. So like there's just different too. variations depending on like how close they are. So I guess because raw I guess. powerlifting developed just to make it accessible and as an attempt to grow the sport or was it that people in raw lift, uh, in gear lifting were like, I just want to see how much I can lift more the way that people traditionally lift in the gym. Um, well, so initially, like way back in the day, I don't think there was a distinction between raw and equipped powerlifting. It's just like everybody used equipment. And people used to like, you know, tape tennis balls behind their knees and shit like that. Like, like way back in the day. <laughs> Have you seen Dave Hoff with the well. medicine ball shoved down his shirt? <laughs> no. Oh my God. Oh my, there's the best video of all time that everyone has to look up. Just look up Dave Hoff bench or Dave Hoff bench medicine ball or something. And you can clearly see, so he's got this arch. And on the first attempt, you're like, man, that guy is barrel fucking chested because yeah. he's, he's a big unit I think he competes about 140 kilos but then it starts to yeah. shift between attempts and then by the third attempt he has you know the chick with three tits yeah, in, yeah. Um, uh, what's that Total Star Recall Trek. oh Total Recall yeah. <laughs> he literally looks like her because he's got his two pecs but then he's got this big central titty where he's clearly touching the bar and Louis Simmons released a really controversial statement being like just completely denying it but yeah That's that, so that was hectic yeah, should we continue with the differences between yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. often are we going? Yeah, so often. Go back to That's bench press. That's podcasting, though. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, difference between raw and equipped bench press. Okay, so equipped bench press, like you said, Louis emphasized the triceps heaps and people emphasize the lats heaps. And I think in the in the instance of the lats, it's because you have to actually pull the bar into like the groove of the shirt. So I've done no, no like equipped benching. I can talk about But there's, that. yeah, there's sort of like a very narrow path of, um, path in which you actually want to pull the bar. The whole gates of bench. Hmm? Like the in 300, the hot gates? Yeah, like the hot gates of bench. Where you basically have to, you have to pull the bar. Fuck, that could have been that one is blown yeah, that like ending process the other day. I was about to have a breakdown. <laughs> um, you gotta, yeah, you have to basically pull the bar into that line when you're benching. And so your touch point, I think, has to be a little bit lower. And you've got to tuck your, tuck your arm a little bit more. So you end up with this massive, massive like lat work on the way down. And you're basically doing a row to get the bar to your chest. Because most people, when they're benching equipped, can't actually touch the bar to their chest until they're getting to relatively heavy weights. So it takes a huge amount of back strength to keep the bar in the groove and actually touch, right? Um, in raw lifting, I don't think the lats are actually important in the bench press. They're like, they play maybe a small supporting role and you could argue that having a thick back is just broadly good for like shortening your range of motion. That's it. Um, and some people have said that like that sort of end so range- in the negative. Yeah, well, but, yeah. but like- Minimal. Yeah, I was gonna say really minimal role. So lats are unimportant. Triceps in raw benching, important for lockout, but most people miss their raw benches about an inch off the chest, whereas lots of people miss equipped benches way up high unless they miss group it. Or they so, just guillotine themselves. Yeah, or they guillotine themselves. Um, so yeah, in the instance of the raw bench, the pecs are way, way more important. And then the pecs and triceps, because like if you're in a, if you're working against like a resistance in your arm, 
extension of the elbow, like extension of the elbow also entails adduction at the chest. They sort of work off each other, but you basically need a strong chest. You can't just rely on tricep strength. Whereas with a shirt, because you get that first little bit out of the actual rebound of the shirt, you need super strong triceps to do that end range elbow extension. So that sort of makes sense? Yes. Yeah, um, it makes good sense. Yeah. So just makes, I've, I have nothing to do with so balance. The shirt, the shirt is essentially pulling you like for the YouTubes, like, yeah. Up here, oh, right? Okay. So oh, when you have so that's so where one of the comes from. So when you have is the bar, like, you when guys you have the bar here, press up like a jack? and you're trying to pull it down. Yeah. You, it feels like it's down at your dick. Yes. But it's not. Uh, so, so and like you are trying to pull the bar like down here, down here, down here, and it's, and it's up here because the shirt's pulling you this way. God, that is so stressful. So when it gets down Does to the chest, compete? did he compete in one? No, no, he was raw with wraps. Okay, because is because he sort of said press like a J, and there's a few things. So for raw, do you recommend? I've heard that as well when grinding. Do you cue people to push back towards the rack slightly from the raw? from the chest? Yes. Okay, but ah. then it's straight. Yeah. See, this is why. I See, from bench. from the core. Yeah, I'm, quick, I'm, 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 I'm trying to use It's actually going to be the opposite. It's going to go. It's going to shoot back. <laughs> this is why I can only bench sixty kilos. See, like, I'm out here pressing, bench, pressing uh, with an invisible suit. You guys are considered- I went and did some, I went and did some equipped, right? My raw max is 145. And I went and did equipped um, with my now coach, JP, at the Strength Fortress, like just after a comp for fun. I couldn't get 160 down to my chest. And then I got- It's that tight. I got 165 to my chest. And I couldn't lock it out because my triceps weren't strong. And so like, I did, like an, hour, I did like an hour of bench and I didn't, didn't, get, a, get, a I didn't get a single rep. Yeah. Fuck so that's like, that's, weird. that's one thing though. Yeah, that, that's weird. That's probably a tangential point, but like, a lot of people would say that equipped powerlifting isn't really a test of strength or something. Like, it's a like it is a serious, serious test of strength, and it's a serious test of technical ability. It's just not at all comparable to raw powerlifting. Like, it's a skill the of, of yeah, raw powerlifting. Is, yeah, the equivalent to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, like the good, it's like pain and pleasure. They're the, like this, you know. Yeah. The good equipped lifters get like so much out of their equipment. Yeah, and that's yeah. not to say that that so means they're much. not strong. They're it good just, raw, but they're not like. I think the IPFs, uh, the way they do the single ply, that's too much more to my taste. Yeah. Multiply, I can't handle it all, but I can really appreciate the skill aspect of single ply, especially like watching someone like Blaine Sumner. Like he's exactly. such a sick technician. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, unbelievable. So, but I guess from again my point of view and the general public point of view, I don't know really what a bench suit looks like on someone, or if someone is like, oh, of course they, I they walk it. like a zombie. But we yeah. just want to see, walk, we just want to see right? the strongest lift possible, so I can see the why. The general has a thirst for raw lifting. Yeah, like, definitely. They just don't know what they're no, looking at. With not them. raw lifting. So the equipped lifting, because we just want to see the heaviest weight move. See, I disagree. Like, oh, oh, something they can relate to. It looks way weirder because you see these guys like doing a 10 second negative to get to the bottom of this yeah, squat true. and their fucking head's exploding. But yeah. would, I just like to think, I suppose I would notice if it would someone off the street, we go, hey, what's more impressive? And they see someone lifting five But if you explain the, the context to what the general public would most, but most people don't see the, most, that the untested raw lifting, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe. Perhaps. I think like, if you, if, you explain, if you explain it to them, maybe. It's, but it's, I'm saying if you pull them off the street and go, watch these two, which is more impressive. I reckon it's analogous to like maybe a couple of musical things and maybe also like there's people in here training for esports it's a bit like esports where it's like probably if you know what's going on mm. then you can really appreciate it but if you don't to you it's just a whole lot of bullshit mm. Mm. that's that's a bit like a quick lifting and in some ways it's also like that mute like when you listen to prog music say where mm. it's like if you're a musician you can be like wow like, this is incredible but if you're not you're just like oh this is stupid bullshit and Whereas, some of it is just masturbation at the end of the day yeah exactly you know, like prog music is like 99 percent masturbation and 10 percent like naming your band something abstract yeah. but <laughs> but like if like if you're into it, you're really into it, and it's amazing. And if you're not, it's like it's too niche for you. Whereas raw lifting is like good pop music, where it's like it's accessible, everyone can get around it, and you don't need to fucking be told what's going on because it's like self-evident, you know. Mm. And so I think that's one of the reasons it's got such wide appeal, and it's also much more accessible for people because like um, equipped powerlifting training takes yonks because it takes ages to get into your suit, it takes ages to warm up. You need to take long rests, like you need to have your fucking knees. Especially if you never set five, foot in you need five gym. spotters, because if you fall over, you're fucked. Like <laughs> I spent, I just spent a huge amount of powerlifting or my powerlifting career, like which is not, um, but a huge amount of yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, ho yeah, hobby dignifies it more than it should. Be. But I spent, <laughs> spent a huge amount a of it, hobby. Literally <laughs> training at fitness first, like early, so I could run off to uni after on my own. Right? Mm. And if I was an equipped powerlifter, there's no way on earth I could have done that. Like I would have had to make huge accommodations to my training 
to make it possible and then I would have been shit at the sport or I would have had to change my life around to make sure that I could go spend time with people. And that brings me all the way back to West Side, which is probably part of the reason why those guys do so good is because they literally say, fuck it, I'm going to move to Columbus or whatever it's called, Ohio. Yeah, it's in Ohio. Like, yeah, I'm going to pick up, like either leave my family or bring them with me and I'm going to spend four days a week you know, with the boys at training where they're surrounded by people that can help them. And most people don't have that luxury. So and you, then my family goes hungry. Because I'm yeah. zero dollars. Yeah, but, but yeah, you still buy from the gym. But I work at the Seven <laughs> Eleven. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So Seven Eleven in Columbus, Ohio, for powerlifters is the equivalent of Uber for Sydney personal trainers. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, never steal from Seven Eleven in Columbus, Ohio. Like, because <laughs> you get chased. Yeah. You're good after ten meters. Yeah, you're good after ten meters. Just go on those first out. ten meters yeah. are bad. But launch yeah. over the counter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking? Let's go back to. The difference between federations, I believe we got to the deadlift, we just discussed bench press. Yes, so oh, this is good for me. Difference between the deadlift and the lift? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. 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 For I don't quick really, yeah, yeah, the, the, the deadlift is the smallest difference. Okay. So you'll see the... the, 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 the less, terribly. yeah, the less, the smallest difference in weight um, is in the deadlift for sure. Like most, there's actually a lot of guys who compete equipped who deadlift raw. Okay. Because they just don't um, get much out of the suit. Because they don't get it much out of the suit. And what? most of them pull sumo because, again, it helps out the hips. Yeah. What does Steffi Cohen do? She does raw. She does raw with wraps. Okay. Um, so she deadlifts. So she deadlifts on a deadlift bar. Oh, okay. So that's another, that's another thing, another difference. In a lot of those raw with wraps divisions, they use different bars for all three lifts. So for the squat, they use a thicker 25 kilo So again, bar. more inaccessible as well for like the general. Yeah, the general yeah. I mean, yeah. in as far as it matters when you turn up at a meet. So right. like in the squat, they use a 25 kilo bar to prevent the bar moving At what point around. does that become a factor? Like the bar, yeah, where you'll heavy. be looking for a Texas Very bar. heavy. Heavy. Okay. Like, um, I think, so Blaine Sumner, when he's squatting Alico 500. The fucking stiff. Well, the Alico one's crazy stiff. And Blaine Sumner says when he's squatting 500, literally the oscillation on the bar is like controlling that as the hardest part of the lift. Dude, the, the whip so, fucked me on one of those FF bars at 190. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, again, <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's, that's the bumpers though. I had to yeah, learn true. I literally had to change my squat rhythm when I stopped training a fitness first regularly and moved to lift because like every time I squatted over 180, it was like, if I hit the hole and came up at the right pace, the bar would be unbending. <laughs> yeah. Sort of as I did the sticking part and it'll like carry me through. Yeah, I found it so much easier to squat a fitness first. Oh, yeah, man. Close on serves and great squats. I think about it as a seminar the other week, but I actually went to it years ago when he first did one. Not at though it wasn't a lift. And he said that's how he goes and cues his jerk. The bar flops up and he goes yeah. bang. But again, that's a, it. that's a luxury of jerking like 200 plus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Me mortals yeah. don't get any. I think yeah. he said so, it was like 190 so plus. more differences it? are deadlift bar. The sure. bar's the same in bench. So they use an Alika bar or a similar stiff yeah. bar. And then in the deadlift, they use uh, like a longer bar and a thinner bar. So mm. they get more flex out of it. Yeah, there's a tiny bit more flex, but the biggest difference is just grip. Because I think somebody actually measured like stiffness and flex in the bar and found the difference is quite negligible. I've pulled mm. on a deadlift they're bar. They're also longer though. Yeah, they are. Dude, I like, you can just fucking crush it though because it's like yeah. a women's weightlifting bar as far as the... Yeah. I don't want to use the curve. curve. Yeah. 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 Good yeah. 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 Thickness. Yeah. yeah. Circumference. Yeah. Radius. Yeah. Really. I mean... <laughs> anyway, let's go on. <laughs> so... Yeah, 100%. Um, but it does make a difference. And grip strength, like... Alex and I were actually talking about this yesterday with regard to my deadlift because grip is my biggest issue. You have some sausage fingers there, mate. Yeah, I do. They're not, they're not very long, though. Little hobbit hands. Yeah. I got little hobbit hands. I was actually. Yeah. Like, do long fingers help? Not yeah, 100% they help. Yeah. I yeah. hold the bar like in my fingers. I feel like that's oh, something wow. that people yeah. don't realize as well. Like, too many people tear in their calluses because they want to palm the bar. Yeah. yeah. No, you don't See, want to. See, mine are all like. Calus oh, stuff. Is that why fingers. not everyone uses hook grip because it shortens your wrong because it has to go deeper in your hand? Uh, I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure. I think most people don't use hook grip because it's painful and hard to learn. But like, yeah. finger strength does matter. So you're, you're I guess there's more weight with the deadlift. Right, like yeah. difference between snatching like 70 hook yeah. grip yeah. and deadlifting yeah. 270 hook grip. I'm just saying. Yeah, like I, hard. I did weightlifting, hook grip wasn't a problem for me. But like, I've tried to hook grip. Do you think if you're allowed so. thumb tape, it would more you people would be hook grip? You are allowed thumb tape. Oh, really? Yeah. two layers of thumb tape, yeah. What? Dude, it fucking hurts. It really and it's a stiff bar as well. Yeah. I, I can't ah. hook over about 220. The knurling is hurts. more aggressive too. Yeah. I true. think we have this one of those in the gym down here and I have noticed that does it have more... So the Olympic lifting bar is sort of smooth right through and then in the middle it has a bit of knurl. Yeah, the comp bar has a bit of bite. Uh, typically there's no centre knurl. Oh man, if we just got some There is on a men's one, not on a women's one. Yeah. Don't know about the fucking sport. There is a centre knurl on a men's weightlifting bar, not yeah. a women's weightlifting bar. Okay. 
No, I'm quite sure what the use of it is, there. like for training only, because they train the squat squats. Yeah. yeah, but like in competition, you know, back squat. Does it stick to your stick to, stick stick to, to you on the catch? No. Like, no. No. Yeah, we have no. a bar down at the gym, and I thought, man, it has a bit of knurling, like right in the center of the bar, maybe like two inches either side of the direct middle, and I was like, maybe it helps, like, sort of sit on your back better. Yeah. Or maybe it was just well, like oh, something. I've never seen that. That's, that's really what I was there heavy. for the powerlifting bars. Though. Okay, so that yeah. is a powerlifting bar. Your shirt, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, there you go. So we do have one of those. Because I was like, this one really hurts my client's hands, and then yeah, I used yeah. it to do that's cleans one day, I was like, ouch. Yeah. Well, especially if it doesn't um, rotate. Yeah, if the collars are bad. Turnover's going to screw your wrists. Yeah, I wasn't paying too much. Or it would just feel like ass. But again, like old school weightlifting, their collars didn't turn. Like, you know, they had like the worst bars in the world. And so your monsters. barbell actually had a, um, they found this way to get these sick bearings in their bars and their, their whip just went through the roof. And so they hosted a competition so they could show off these new bars. Sorry, don't say whip, the um, spinning of yeah, the yeah. sleeves. And in that competition, it was an international competition, and five lifters dislocated their elbows. Oh, so shit. you don't want too much spin on it. There's like yeah. an actual sweet spot. It is a real art there. One day I just went balls deep, sort of reading into weightlifting bars and stuff like that. <laughs> so supposedly, uh, when Wait, you, buy, you went balls deep in reading deep. about weightlifting bars, yeah. but you didn't know there was a center mill. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and even I. How deep did you get, mate? <laughs> <laughs> you were only on the weightlifting subreddit, <laughs> were you? You weren't on the. You weren't on the and I read <laughs> one article, but it was heaps in depth. Stay, oh, like, stay yeah. off Reddit, dude. Yeah, it was I Reddit. Reddit, 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 Reddit. Uh, weightlifting. It was linked on there. Fuck, for sure, one hundred percent. Do you guys post your podcast in Reddit? Power. I've discussed this. We are actually uh, trying to share it. Got shared, it got shared by yeah. the Good, good, good. I made an account. Saves. I made an account to actually share the Wilkes one. And Dude, but then the Reddit is fucking there. the king. Like we, I posted Sam Locks in the rowing subreddit. Shout out to those guys. Fuck, it went hard. It got like two point two thousand views in the first day. Oh, by wow. the boys and girls Shit. on their last like, Sam Lock. Yeah, and I, because I'm like always in the sprinting subreddit. So we always do like the photo of me, you and Johan Blake still at the top of the feed. Ah, nice. Um, nice. So we get a lot of traction there, but I Angus has posted stuff in bodybuilding and they'll fucking destroy you. I posted one in the dunking and NBA Reddit. Don't ever go oh, into yeah, that. They're heavy, that. man. No. They're fucking heavy. NBA, but, NBA Twitter is fucked. And I imagine the powerlifting one's quite heavy because I've been in there and I was like, yeah, yeah no, not, not my space. A lot of hostile people. But it's pretty funny about when camps. Ray Williams was posting in there asking for advice on his squat. Yeah. Wait, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah, way He's back the in the... Man, that was the after his squat 900. He's the yeah, he had no idea. I think at his first meet, he like, what was it? He didn't know how to wrap his knees or something. He went like in a... It was something like he went in a competition with wraps and his wraps were like literally like you could put your hand under them. <laughs> and his, his attempts were like 600, 700, 800 and like he didn't know how to warm up or anything like that. And people were just like, what are you... Like, it's some <laughs> stupid story like that, but people were like, what are you Who doing? Like, you are an absolute freak. So at one point, Reddit actually had a little crowdfunding thing because he ran out of space on his bar for plates. And he didn't <laughs> have to the competition bar. Bar. So yeah, they bought him one of those He's got a rack bars. now. He's got a... He's a little rack. ambassador. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's got a rack and bars shit. and everything. Yeah, yeah. good. And he kills it. He's got heaps of sponsors. He's similar story. Legend, similar That's story is Tom Martin. Do you guys know him? Yeah, yeah. I loved him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like, he was a sprinter, I think, or like a hurdler or something, um, British. And he posted on a forum, it might have been the bodybuilding.com forums, and he was saying like, oh, you know, like, I'm deadlifting, like, you guys are into powerlifting, is this good? Like, I pull 350, I weigh like 90 kilos. And, and people, were like, <laughs> people were like, yeah, bullshit. And he's like, no, no, guys, like, I honestly do. And everyone was like, yeah, like, fuck off, back in your box, you troll. And so he posts some video of him, like, deadlifting, yeah, 350 kilos, something just absolutely outrageous. That's and people cool. were like, holy shit, like, you could be Actually literally, like, do the best of all time, like, you better get on this real quick. So he was like, YOLO, ditches sprinting, and goes, like, full hardcore on the gym. Um, he, and and it was so good to see. He did pro raw like a few months ago in Sydney. He went Melbourne at the <laughs> answer. He went three out of nine, and he still won. So you literally got one of the powerlifting for you. I swear, everyone just tries to fire. Wait, what's nah, his name? His, his, yeah. his, his, like, his was like his was like um Tom travel. Martin. He looks like a Viking. His was like travel and stuff. Yeah, like he okay. hit weights that he hit weights, missed weights that he's hit. How did you go traveling? Because you went to Singapore recently to compete. Singapore was fine. Yeah. Uzbekistan was a lot harder. Is it? Yeah, Uzbekistan was for you guys. guys. Uh, I think it's worse if you have to cut weight. He definitely looks like a herd, man. It's worse if you have to cut weight for sure. Oh wait, is it, does he have a ponytail? Uh, yeah, oh, he's got like full on. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's how old is he? Uh, I don't know, maybe thirty or something. Yeah. Fuck, he looks like he's an animal. Every bit of forty in this photo. <laughs> um, yeah, something that I've always kind of trashed. Well, I just didn't understand it. Actually, I don't know. I was, it was immature to trash it because I've realised that it's probably a valuable exercise because I know Will's a fan. Touch and go deadlifts. Yeah. And also deficits. Yeah. So what 
what is the good and bad application like discuss okay um i'll start with deficits and then we can move to touch and go so because people love a snatch grip deficit Okay, I think oh, a snatch grip, snatch grip in powerlifting. Okay, I think snatch grip deficits have. I was actually talking to Luke Tullock, who you've had on here about this. I reckon they have a super limited application in powerlifting, um, and I would only use them with very specific cases a long way from comp. But ninety percent of the time, I think they're trash. Actual deficit deadlifts, I think, can be really helpful for people. Um, there's a bit of conjecture. Some people seem to think they help you off the floor. I disagree. Um, I think they can help you a little bit off the floor because they teach you to use leg drive better. But the main thing that happens with a deficit is because you have to start further over the bar, you end up in a slightly compromised position as you're passing the knee. So most people's back is a tiny bit rounded and they're in a slightly suboptimal position. It teaches them to grind and lock out and it really strengthens your back. So I think deficits can be a really, really useful tool for most people, provided like the deficit's about right and the loading's about right. Um, touch and go deadlifts. and. Similar thing for touch and go deficits, by the way. I just think it makes it easier for people to handle more volume. And because you actually lose the benefit of the touch and go right at about your normal starting position, uh, just like to me, I've found the carryover slightly better. But again, I'm not wedded to that idea. Touch and go deadlifts, I think, again, can be really useful um, for a couple of reasons. One, easier to get out a bunch of volume, less sold on that reason. The other reason that I think they can be good is if people do touch and go with a proper controlled eccentric, then they can use the eccentric portion of the motion to actually teach themselves like the groove properly. Because oftentimes you'll see people do say a set of four or five deadlifts and the first rep their position will be shit and then suddenly the second and third and so on reps are better. So touch and go can actually really drill where you should be in your starting position. Almost like I guess the box squat equivalent, like it can be a good yeah. teaching tool in that regard. Yeah, and then one other thing, and again, I'm less wedded to this idea, but like potential benefit is that like there are benefits to eccentric loading in general and when we train the deadlift because it's a concentric only movement doing some eccentric loading probably helps and particularly for things like the hamstrings where we like you do actually want increase in fascicle length which you get from eccentric loading as opposed to just doing concentric work there's probably some benefit to like improving their starting position and improving their actual hamstring mobility and stuff mm. from doing controlled eccentrics mm. but again i think all that stuff's sort of like a like pick the right tool at the right time thing rather than saying these are a magical application. I just wouldn't throw them out straight away. Whereas okay. snatch grip, deficit deadlifts and powerlifting, I think are fucking trash. Unless well, you've got like a serious erector problem. Measure up their snatch. So is that the thing in, so is the snatch grip Wait, deadlift in powerlifting just like take your hands wide and not actually measure up your correct position? I've softened my snatch. stance on that. Yeah, well, it's well, something that we're I'm going to I'm gonna throw this to Alex because you've done well, do snatch you feel, deadlifts and hated them but have you ever used them for a climb no. and also just quickly yeah. do you feel the same about touch and go and deficits um i think regarding that the most important part of the deadlift is your starting position so if you can nail your starting position you'll probably be okay elsewhere so if those two exercises can help you nail your starting position then they can be fine applications of those exercises but then again it's going to be for the individual yeah. yeah. So for the touch and go, you might give that to someone who like rounds a lot through their back, so they're learning how to control the weight through the on the way down, sort of teach themselves where to be. Um, and for the deficit, you might give that to someone who struggles to actually get their chest up off the bottom, and you actually make it even harder for them to get their chest up. And then when you bring them back onto the ground, it's a little bit easier. Yeah. So if if those two exercises are being used, I have used them both a little bit, but only when the time's right. Yeah, I actually should add another thing that's probably useful about like a touch and go deadlift, again, with a proper control to centric, is that lots of people struggle to actually sort of like find hamstring tension off the ground when they're starting to pull. Yes. And so again, if you're giving them like that cue of what hamstring tension feels like in an eccentric, that's a teaching tool. But pretty much like Alex said, it's like, you basically are only doing these things to make your actual deadlift better and it's actually like, and the actual deadlift's execution better. But that's so, what I see like in the general pop, like especially in a commercial gym, it's like no one knows how to use their hamstrings effectively in a deadlift. Like everyone's got that little tuck under mm. sort of thing. Yeah, or everybody wants Which to just shoot their knees flexion, forward and then smash them into the bar and then, yeah, and then use their back to finish because nobody actually locks out properly. How, do you just have an opinion on flexion? Like any, let's talk about... On let's flexion, flexion in general and yes. all joints. <laughs> all like, sorry, yes, yeah, yeah. in the back. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the spine. So, because so, I've heard so many different things from so many different people, where it's just like, you know, as much spinal flexion as you want, right through the whole thing, you'll be fine. <laughs> Lumbar flexion is no, but thoracic extension is fine. Um, that's mine. Fucking oh, man, does, that, does that stop that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you just touch that? Yeah, man. 
Is that one still going? Yeah, that one's still going. going. Uh, yeah, Groom. You fucking Send your text message. Groom. Is that Graham? No, Just it's one of my mates. <laughs> Fuck, he's the bloke. His character's the Groom. Yeah, Groom. Oh, That's like if you listen to the last episode. He's very much like a... His nickname's a cross the Grub. Cross the Worm. That's how we got Groom. Grub. Worm. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's him. It sounds like a good bloke. He's actually... No, he's great. Everyone has such a tenor so... Bells. <laughs> that, that's him. Anyway, so he just called me. Fuck. Okay, that's that's completely like, he, he always does this. He does. And then he'll ring again. And uh, are you I'm sure he's not just done. on the troll? You don't reckon he's probably? No, like, he's we're, not, we're not live anywhere. So. Yeah, but it's in like you don't reckon he's just called your mum and been like, "Oh, what time are the boys <laughs> recording right. today?" And then be like, "Yeah." He's pretty cool. Might be like, "Go food in the house. I'm in the gong. Uh, <laughs> come around." Anyway, where are we, um, should we, get, we need to get into our scripted questions. Let's wrap this up. Okay. Flexion in the deadlift. What parts of the spine? Just all of it. Do you want to start? No, you can okay, um, what's up? I'm just heading up for a pause. Oh, right. No, no, you guys keep going. Okay, so... He won't contribute to this part yeah, of the conversation. Yeah. He doesn't have an opinion. Okay, flexion in the deadlift. Um, thoracic flexion, I don't have an enormous problem with, although, so thoracic being upper back, although re-extending your upper back late in the deadlift can be difficult. Mm. So I think it's one of those things where you want to set with a degree of thoracic flexion um, if you're going to experience some and try and hold it. I don't think rounding your upper back enormously is helpful. Mm. I also think people should protract their scapula when they're sitting up. Like this is particularly- I heard that Reese. I think Jimmy got that piece of advice from you and that was a game changer. Like I knew you wanted the arms long, but I, don't, I wasn't like intentionally yeah, yeah, protracting. Yeah. And intentionally yeah. reach for it. Yeah. I, I found that very so helpful. With, with doing that, you will get a little bit- Yeah, you Because that's another thing that I think people are so obsessed these days because people generally do sit with their shoulders forward. That's a postural issue we see. Yeah. Um, but people are, just don't know when it is acceptable to protract in a lot of movements. I think everyone's so obsessed with like retraction, depression, which are obviously very, very useful tools for cert in certain circumstances. But yeah, to not fear the protraction. So I actually like I actually have an article about deadlift positioning on my website, willberkman.com. Um, yeah, so www.willberkman.com, deadlift fixes to stop your back hurting and fix your lockout, I think it's called. Um, I do talk about this a little bit. So yeah. Scapular protraction and depression coupled is really helpful because it makes your arm longer and it keeps it closer to your hip, right? That is gonna have to be coupled with a mild amount of thoracic flexion. So in a powerlifting, like in a powerlifting context, mild thoracic flexion, probably fine. Super extreme thoracic flexion, you're sort of playing with fire because re-extending it's really hard. As far as your lumbar spine goes, my general position is that people should be somewhere between neutral and extended. Mm -hmm. If you are somebody who is really prone to lumbar flexion, then you're probably better to set with the amount of lumbar flexion you're going to experience. And that's like a, that's a probably Stuart McGill thing. Um, look him up if you're interested in back pain, but I, it again, the leg spin up. Oh no, but I'm just thinking, so if someone, <laughs> Angus doesn't know. Sorry, no, I just, he would not get that. Um, yeah. well, if you're in lumbar extension, I thought that was bad because it kind of like, uh, unnecessarily lengthens the hamstrings and so, gives them a mechanical disadvantage. How do you so do you hard hard lumbar extension okay. is probably a disadvantage, which is why I say neutral to mildly extended. Mm. But at the same time, I don't like. I don't think you should be at the absolute end range of your hamstring range of motion. Um, I do think part of the reason that people fall into lumbar flexion in the deadlift is often because they don't have good hamstring strength at length. And so they're doing that to shorten the hamstring a little bit as opposed to actually lacking the back extension strength to hold it. Mm. Because often those people who fall into some lumbar flexion then actually finish their lockout without hip extension but with a massive back extension. Yes. So to me, that says that those people actually need to develop some hamstring strength and control. Mm. And so then you can do other loaded hip hinge things and stuff like 45 degree back extensions where you stop them actually at full hip extension rather than the final back extension or Romanian deadlifts or anything like that where you actually get them some hamstring strength and control. But basically, I don't think lumbar extension is something that I would encourage. If it's a reality of your deadlifting position, then I think you work around it. But thoracic flexion to a degree, I'm fine with. Um, Alex? Yeah, pretty much the same stance. But I think the important thing to note is if you are someone who is prone to especially lumbar flexion, mm. it ne you need to start in that position. Yes. If you're pulling yourself from neutral to flexion, that's where you're going to have an issue. Yeah. And it's the same thing with thoracic flexion. If you're starting mildly flexed and ending like massively flexed, you're going to have an issue. And Let's I talk to, about yanking. I used to have that problem as well. Let's talk about yanking. 
So one of the reasons or one of the things that I see with people who actually start with an okay back position and then as they break the floor, they round really badly is often these are people who try and like basically yank the bar off the floor. Especially so, on a stiff boy. Yeah, especially like stiff bar, I presume you mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> as opposed to a stella. stiff athlete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's people who, are, people who are trying to yank the bar off the floor actually sacrifice position for the sensation of immediate speed. And so Alex and I both coach holding shape and both coach taking, taking the tension out of the bar. So Alex has a I cue. I love some of your guys' cues because it's very like removed from what I hear. I well, just hear heels. Yeah, okay. So I actually coach four foot pressure in the deadlift regularly as well. People who are too far back on their heels often rebalance forward and then fall over the bar and then fuck it up. So I, I teach people... This. I teach people like a tripod stance, so big toe, little toe, heel down, and oftentimes they're way too far back on their heels. People should be able to sit back and create some tension against the, the bar. If the heels aren't coming off the ground, stop saying fucking heels, everyone, please. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's I've missed the point, um, or I'm off the point. The point is people who yank the bar off the floor are often the same people who experience that bad back position. So aim to hold shape, aim to create tension against the bar before you actually start your push. Again, this is in my article too. So take the slack out, <laughs> take the slack out of the bar, create some foot pressure, and then That's start Will pulling Bergman. on shape. Com. Will Bergman dot com. Yeah. W. Bergman PT on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you get, you I can say my bank details at the end as well, like my Patron page or whatever. <laughs> um, Patreon. Patreon, yeah. yeah. Patron's the drink, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Also, accept, also accept Patron. Make, um, make your sheep pants. Oh, does really? it? Yeah. yeah. You sure that like, wasn't the. You know, there's some mornings I can probably <laughs> code it from the <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, anyway, I think we've pretty well covered that. But don't yank the bar off the floor if this is your problem because you're probably making it fucking worse. Yeah. Oh, good yeah, one, one cue that I use is no noise. Yeah. And what that refers to is um, there being no sort of noise as the bar comes off the floor. No yeah, chip that that no, no little click. I feel like every gym goer could adhere to that so and if say, you, don't if, crazy. You, if you pull the slack out of the bar and you're able to hold the slack out of the bar and then you're able to push your feet to the floor to initiate the movement, your back is going to be more likely to stay in position. Yeah, those are good cues. So we go into this group of questions. Right, one, one, one more thing, it's important. Um, the whole like I know a lot of the best deadlifters in the world, and probably most as I understand it, have their head position up, and I think it's similar in the squat. What I find is that a lot of people head up also leads to too much uh, lumbar extension as well. How how do you, do you have tips for managing? getting your head up without going into extension. Cause it's something that I run into with a lot of people. I agree with you. I don't actually coach people to put their head up. Um, I coach people to have a long spine. I tell them to set their gaze ahead of them, maybe 10 or 15 feet ahead on the floor. So their eyes will be looking up and then their eyes should stay in the same place. If you were to watch a video of me deadlifting, my head starts stacked over my spine. When I finish, it's almost forward a little bit. Throwing your head back often gives you the illusion of extension and actually drives you into hard extension. But people often, yeah, I think lose tightness off the floor because of it. So I say long spine, eyes ahead and up, and then keep your eyes still. Don't throw your head back. Throwing your head back's bullshit. Your head also weighs like seven to ten percent of your body weight. So in terms of your yeah. weight, it's <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, big heads as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Must, Alex's must is nearly thing. empty, so Alex can afford to throw his head back heaps. But the rest of you are actually changing your weight distribution around the bar when you're doing it, right? Um, and Mark Ripto, who I really frequently disagree with, actually wrote... <laughs> call wrote him out, bro. Call him out. Yeah, no. See, we'll, we, we have this thing on our podcast, but I always call milk? people out. Uh, no, I love milk. I'm fine with him on that. I'm, yeah, Go Mad is sick. I'm voluntary Go that. Mad. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I would cut on Go Mad if I could. Um, yeah, wait, no. I always call people out on our podcast, and we'll always fucking... Apologize. Text me afterwards, like, so, dude, stop calling people out. No, no, no you got it. And now, yeah. 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 He just calls these people out. Um, you know, no, some if you're not slinging shit on the mic, what are you doing? Yeah, anyway, Mark Ripto actually speaks about this... Um, in a way that I tend to agree with um, when he's talking about head position in the deadlift. I think your spine should be long and I think you set your eyes slightly up and continue to follow that position. I don't think you throw your head back. It doesn't help. And it's just bullshit that makes you think that you're extending your back. For me, the cue... Well, I don't use any cues for head position. I kind of leave it up to the lifter. And some of my lifters will look down, some of them will look straight, some of them will look up. And it kind of comes down to like where they feel comfortable and where they feel balanced. But the key is that the head position stays still. Yeah, and ruthless is it when you're coaching someone through the deadlift for the first time, and they'll turn, they'll do the Chucky doll, and they'll just turn the head to the side. What about Ben Halligan? Where he always used to lift. Do you guys ever see? So we had a guy 
we had when we worked when I worked and Angus worked in the gong we had like a bunch of kids and they were just doing squat bench dead and he always looked at his left hand and what did Ben deadlift up to like 230 yeah but Ray Williams also looks to the right when, when he's always yeah, yeah he, he got red in respect for that I fucking Wait, like what he got red he got, he got a red light for looking to his side on like his second or third bench maybe he was just trying to dad to celebrate well, maybe. didn't let him on the bar no he like, he said it's just something that he does like it's just he still does it so what oh, it annoyed me anyway I laid into him I said Ray you're fucking you're yeah. never gonna be any good <laughs> <laughs> straight off reddit comments Let, look, yeah. let's get into these scripted questions because right, our SD card is saying we got 18 minutes left All right. to wrap this up so if you have to choose a rapper to rap about yourselves who would it be what would they rap did you prep them say? for this question no, no I prepped them for one of them fuck I'm going through my bank of like two um, rappers that I know <laughs> I would go I would go with Drake how, are you a fan of the like, recent I'm, double album? I'm only, no, uh, I'm only half into it. To it's good. It's fucking Dude, it's, it's so, so hard to do a double album. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know why. The, um, the, Fuck, I'm the Jay-Z right. verse came on this morning when I was listening to it. Surprisingly good. Sick. Yeah. Anyway, I'd get um, Drake to rap about me. What would he say? Because he's like a bit hard, but he's also like he's soft as well. Too. So like, yeah, a bit of contrast to it. So he'd yeah. R&B a bit. What would he say that? I don't know. See, I was going to say something about like, you could reference 100% rule or how you like, Fuck chicks, and then also have a bit plates. Drake's not saying that. Like, no, Drake's not saying that. So I was hoping yeah, you referenced like young Savage. Or something. Yeah, 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 someone like that. Well, yeah, I'm thinking Andre three thousand. Oh, uh, no, that's a good one. Uh, he's, he's a very good. Yeah, he's like he's, he's a sick rapper underrated. and like musical as well. Yeah, super and, like, musical. Yeah, like if you listen to Speakerbox slash The Love Below, he's The Love Below. Like some of his songs are fucking great and like really musical, but his rhymes are hilarious as well. Like I crack up when I listen to Outkast frequently. So, so I reckon he's the man. What would you say? About oh, about me, not much. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Talk about Will struggles yeah. with No, me. he he oh, his, really? he's So got, you're a hundred percent raw and he's struggling. <laughs> he's got this. Uh, with women's and weights. There's a streak of women's songs on the album AC Aliens or whatever where he's got like these dumb analogies about how cool he is. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed. They're awesome. They're so funny. He's like calling a polar bear's toenails or something. And then there's some other one about some dude sipping a like what is it, a milkshake and a so snowstorm like or something. The it's most just polite dumb. version of that my dick song by Mickey Avalon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I could get around Mickey Avalon as well. I actually. Like there's Mickey Mickey Avalon's white rapper story. next to Yeah, yeah. yeah um, 100%. There's, yeah, I reckon I'd go Andre 3000 or like, yeah. Probably See, my favourite favorite white rapper, and this is who would rap about me, is Shia LaBeouf. He, he's actually, fly. Like, I can't always no, talk about it. I feel like I should talk Have you done. seen his freestyle? I saw it, and it's not that good. People it's are like, it's awesome. actually really good, yeah, for it's an actor. It's, yeah, exactly right. Still the greatest. It's like saying Lonzo Ball's a good rapper. It's like saying Clopas is good, yeah, he's a good, like good at bench. It's like, no, yeah. I tell you, he's a good rapper for a dollar. dollar. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He is top five for me. Exactly. Marshall Lynch. Exactly. Have you heard that song? No, I haven't. Fucking awesome. Top song. five favorite athletes. Who's going first? Okay, I'll, go, oh, you go. I'll go first. Okay, so I've I've thought about this from like my entire life. <laughs> good, good, because that's what you got to do for this question. <laughs> so, my first the, the first sport that I fell in love with was cricket. Why so, do you have so many people that like cricket? Um, no, <laughs> but I haven't played since I was like 13. But anyway, uh, Brett Lee. Oh, oh, he can sing about it. I yeah. love Brett Lee. God, he can eat a wheat bick, that guy. <laughs> Dude, I can eat way more wheat How many you did? So my PB and I wrote into Trevor Hendy when I was a kid. But he's my top favourite athlete. Who the fuck's like, oh, I've got eight of those. I was like, I'm right to this guy so who's sport. I used, to eat, <laughs> my I used to eat 18 two by two with milk and honey when I was like eight. I love how you like describe it like a fucking two by two. Two by two, I'd fucking Dude, read I had two by two. I had one of those Nutrigrain bowls where it had lines in it that were like, jump you know, okay, legend, yeah. champion and stuff. And I was a fat kid. Now I'm talking when I was like eight, my mom had to throw it out. Fat little champion, weren't you? Oh, mate, I, used to, I used to go through a box, man. Every morning, I'd be there. Like, there's so many funny stories about me eating when I was young. My mate's brother used to babysit me and my mum would get like a family size lasagna to cook it. And he'd go, oh, well, well, I bet you couldn't eat all that. And I'd be like, fuck off, I could. Give me that champion bowl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was, it was, it was 115 bowl. kilos when it was a year 12. What? Yeah. 100%. Were you, were you playing front row? Right, yeah, I was playing front row. Right. Sure. Of course. Yeah, standard. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so go back to yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, And then um, <laughs> after cricket, I started playing basketball. First basketball player um, that was my favourite was Tracy McGrady. Fuck, Ken Dunk. And then I went, the then because of him, I went for the Houston Rockets. Still go for the Houston yeah, Rockets. Huge fan. Shout out to the boys. The boys. Um, <laughs> couldn't get all the way this year, maybe next so year. So close, fuck the refs, <laughs> fuck the Warriors. <laughs> refs, um, refs in for seven. <laughs> Um, have you guys seen that um, photo of Adam Silver wearing a Warriors jersey? 
No. So good. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> He's the commissioner of the NBA. Right. Um, and then, obviously, James Harden now because of the Rockets. Yeah. And um, LeBron because he's the greatest player of all time. And uh, the last one was someone from powerlifting, Pete Rubish. Pete I Rubish. Dude, oh, I, he was one of my really first really favorite powerlifters. He, he got me into, like, just, like, being fucking intense when you deadlift. And, uh, Those old laundry videos that, where, yeah. he's do, when when he's he's where he yeah. smashes, like, 700 pounds for one of the first times. And then you just see his mum walk past in the background, yeah, shaking so her head with a basket of washing. It's so good I've seen that, yeah. <laughs> because his intensity is, like, RP 11. Yeah. And then she's just like, eh. Yeah. Oh, that's a good top five. Like that. All right. Um... God, mine alone. So number one, <laughs> number one, David Pocock. He's just the man. Nothing like him. Yeah, he's such a good leader. Yeah, he's such a good leader. The like, team's so much better. PC, I honestly he's reckon he's worth like minimum ten points to every team he plays on. And like he's so people think he's only a good defender and like a good jackal. But one of the reasons that he went to Japan was to like improve his link play. So I think in our first test against Ireland recently, he topped the passes I think by Wallaby forward, and he was like way up there in run meters as well. Like he's insane. Worth ten to fifteen points on your team. Dead set legend, like insane physique, just the man. So, so David yeah. Pocock, was so bench? Jack. Who well, hold on, keep that thought because I want to ask um, you guys that when we are. Uh, yeah, right. Okay, before we get no, 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 probably no, wrong. No. So quiet. David Pocock, talk about the other lifts. complete opposite end of the I'm spectrum, saying, really. just for like comedy value. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, easily like the ultimate troll to ever play world sports, yes, says yeah, the yeah, funniest like things on earth. But he's actually insane. Like, look up old school's lifetime highlights. He just makes people look stupid. Because he's like six oh, he does. When he's playing the Ajax in um, oh, man. the Netherlands. Crazy. Yeah, oh, God. Like, he stands up like five, six defenders at a time. He's like six two. He's got no right to be that athletic. He just makes people look dumb. So yeah. he's great. Well, did you see yeah. his first goal in the MLS? No. Nah. For LA Galaxy? You oh, it was from pizza. way out, right? Yeah, 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 yeah and crazy. Chips the keeper. Yeah. Stupid. Um, then tied Federer and Nadal because like I love both of them like both champion athletes and like really good but just as a rivalry that's been something that like I love tennis I've loved tennis for ages and that's been something that's been able to fixate me for literally like my whole adult life both yeah. good dudes as well yeah great dudes yeah. and like just think of how many epic games they've played oh so, so many poor Nadal he's lost most of them yeah but like unless it's on clay yeah but I mean that Wimbledon final when he first won was like yeah. oh, unbelievable so them Nadal's also hotter it depends who you talk to. What about yeah. his hairline on the gut? Yeah, oh, I've seen him recently. Do. And yeah, like and four arm discrepancy in arm size. Yeah. Oh, he's got that tug and arm discrepancy yeah. for sure. <laughs> oh, it's probably from <laughs> tennis, actually. Oh, think about yeah. that. oh yes, oh, he has to ever touch use. himself. <laughs> this is worse than the rowing incident. What? Like rowing versus kayaking. Oh yeah, fuck. The boat was it last two? Yeah, yeah I'm battling. I gotta remember. I think one of my last ones was John Eels, which like he's similar to the David Pocock. Like he's just a legend. Yeah. Um, he's just a legend category and then the and also like led us to world cups like so many aspects of his character are great mm. not a big fan and of him like a legend of a bloke still yeah man about the plaza are actually great but oh, really? great bloke yeah I asked him he was buying seafood he's telling me he was having a barbie I'm like man you're a good bloke like <laughs> you know. he goes thanks Will I yeah. didn't need to hear that I know I <laughs> yeah. he's literally sick of hearing it yeah and then the final one controversial pick but Leighton Hewitt and very good yeah the reason good I like Leighton like Started out as a dickhead who was like incredible. Yeah. And I remember watching him when he was world number one for like two years. And he was just like amazing, but a bit of a dick. But we took like, those days for granted going straight from Pat Rafter into Leighton. And yeah, oh, like, man, someone else. Pat Rafter, honorable mention. I used to like, I stayed up when I was like five to watch him play Goran even in, even in the ditch in the Wimbledon finals. Did you play tennis yourself? Yeah, I, I was actually all right for a little fat little the little fat little just, just, just the big boy. Just the big dog. Yeah, no, I had a really good kick serve, even though I was hit short, it was funny. Um, But I learned to kick serve because I love Pat Rafter. But anyway, Leighton Hewitt, yeah, the man, like great competitor. And now like, oh, he's retired now, but like in the mm. twilight of his career, think how many times he took people who were just flat better than him mm. to five sets yeah. and like just, just fucking so hard never says die the like he could be down Aussie battler he yeah. could be down by two sets five love 40 love and he's like yeah I got this <laughs> like, he's just determined to keep bums in seats yeah. oh, man. he's just the man and so yeah the fact that he's turned it around and he's turned into like such a statesman after being a dick to whatever that chick from home and away was Beck Hewitt and, oh no Clyde. Beck Hewitt is with her sorry Kim Clijsters who we like oh Kim Clijsters um, yeah the fact he's able to turn it around I reckon he's the man so I'm into Leighton Hewitt no, there sure. you go good for you and the one question I want to ask both of you guys, I more wanted to ask Alex is because he loves basketball. Out of every NBA player, who would you pick and you get to coach him to be a powerlifter? To be a powerlifter? Yeah. Spud Webb. 
<laughs> there has to, has to be current. Has to oh, be current. I, I literally know like three current NBA players. That's, that's tough. Because we had a lot of guys. Jeff Nippard on, and we uh, said he's a bodybuilder. We said, who would you like to see bodybuilding? He said Dwight Howard because of his proportions. Oh man, Dwight Howard's that guy. He's the silly. Superman dunk. Yeah, yeah. yeah he looks a lot like of an those action guys. Are... Did he get horizontal? No. Like how much? No, 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 no. He just yeah. put on a cape and did a dunk. A lot of, a lot of like my guys are too long, too long, and yeah. Not really built for powerlifting. Who's like the shortest? Uh, 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 maybe uh, like uh, maybe I'd go with like Patrick Beverly. Yeah, Patrick just, Beverly. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. feisty. Yeah, he could go hard. How oh, heavy he's do you reckon he could one. get? How heavy do you reckon? Oh, would you keep him sort of nah, you'd, like nineties? He'd need to get. He'd need to get into the one hundred fives. You know what? I got a different. He's, he's fucking different feisty. school of thought. I'd go through and find like the most second class, really bad like center or four man or something who like is really unexplosive can't jump just gets by on being on Chris and just pausing us I mean, have you seen his bench read his rehab documentary well I just teach him to be deadlift only like, like <laughs> horrible squatter like squat for a token like token total bench for a token total but just find somebody who's just gangly and make him deadlift and that'd be yeah. Yeah. that's it yeah, yeah. There'd, be, there'd be a lot of like five well there'd be like a lot of six foot guys with like six Eight wingspans in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's, that's like some close to four hundred kilo deadlift. Mo Bamba's got the, training. the biggest ever. I think he's, he's like tall, over eight he's like six Yeah, he's, he's super yeah. tall. I think there was actually somebody who correlated like um, your squat, like how vertical your torso likes to be when you squat, though, and jumping ability, which kind of makes sense. Um, in that, like, you know, if you're somebody who likes to fold at the hips, heaps, you're probably not going to get like lots of upward propulsion. If that oh. makes sense. So I reckon lots of the basketballers who have mad hops may not immediately be good deadlifters. I'm not sure if that's true. That could be complete bullshit. Yeah, that's but I'd be looking for somebody who is like, has a good broad jump or something, but doesn't have a great vertical. And then just be like, yeah, you're my boy. Actually, what about actually, health? actually, you know who'd be really that's good would be Eric Gordon. Eric Gordon? He's yeah. Kind of, he's kind of chunky. I think he has really long sort he's of ankle athletic. to uh, Yeah, super athletic. He's so long through ankle to knee. Though. But he's, he's like not fit. He's like explosive. Yeah, so yeah, that's true. That's perfect. I heard a rumor he might be signing with the Pacers. That's not happening. No, what do you mean? Yeah, he's, he's still on contract. Where is LeBron? Well, no, that's what I saw. If we figure that out, it comes out in next week. Yeah, yeah I reckon he's going to the Lakers. Was there ever the conversation that he was heading to the Rockets? They, I swear they said he was going have, everywhere. It would have had to have been a trade and he opted out of his contract, so it yeah. won't happen. Can't anymore. happen. Anyway, that's it. Well, that Wait, happen. boys, I got a plug. Yeah, you got a yeah. plug. The show, right. sponsors. Um, we, are weekly, we are weekly weights. Weekly weights. We are mates. We lift weights. And <laughs> but it's weekly. And G-Man G- footy. Yeah, G-Man footy. G-Man. So weekly weights spelt like weak, not strong. Yeah. Weekly weights. <laughs> um, <laughs> because Will's weak. Yeah, I'm your boy Will. So I'm at w.berkmanpt on Instagram. I'm at alexfays underscore lift on Instagram. You, you can have find a catchphrase? Weekly weights. Um, we are mates. We lift weights. G-Man footy. It. Just the process? <laughs> Trust me. Ah, uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, do you watch Hot Ones? I got that on t-shirt. Show. I, got, I just got some Team Hayes t-shirts. What t-shirt? Got to trust uh, the process on the back. The uh, uh, complex yeah, media yeah. hot wings. Yeah, you want. No. Where the smell is on the show. Uh, no. Yeah, weekly weights though on iTunes, Podbean. If you leave us reviews, we read them out on the show. Um, Fuck, that's awesome. Oh, I'm gonna write. Hundred percent. We do our own. We do our own transition music. Yeah, like bad transition music's our thing. So if you like, all right, boys. How about you fucking sing us out of this one? Beatbox, do you want a rap? Beatbox. High performance yeah. podcast? Mm, 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 mm. High performance podcast with the boys sitting around here with the fresh new toys, laying down lines and making jokes. Now we're out here to not smoke because we're health professionals. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Alright, guys, make sure to check these guys out on Instagram. <laughs> Podbean, iTunes, <laughs> everywhere. Uh, Leave them a review. Leave them a review. Read it out. Uh, guys, thanks for coming on. <laughs> thanks, thanks, guys. Dude, <laughs> that was, that was, that was No, it didn't. That was, <laughs> that was, that was, that was